It's a great pleasure. Hi, Andreas Görling. It's a great pleasure to have Andreas here today at the Casus Institute seminar. And thanks for hanging in, everyone, in the, in the, in the who's participating. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll just say a very few words to introduce Andreas. So Andreas Görling began his career in academia uh, with a PhD in physical and theoretical chemistry at the Technical University of Munich. And after that, he spent a few years working with John Perdue, who, um, if you work in density functional theory, then you for sure know who John Perdue is. He's one of the main figures in, in DFT. And this was at uh, Tulane University in New Orleans in the US. And after that, uh, Andreas Görling returned back to Germany. And since 2004, if I'm not wrong, he's a professor in the Department of Chemistry and Pharmacy at the University of Erlangen Nuremberg, and there he is the chair of theoretical chemistry. And Andreas had various contributions to both methods development and applications of electronic structure theory and DFT in particular. Among these, uh, he is most well known for developing the Girling Levy perturbation theory. And he's also known for, for his work on, on the exact exchange methodology. So Thanks again, Andreas, for being here today at the Institute Seminar. Uh, and I look forward to your presentation and I'll just hand over to you now. Okay, yeah, thank you for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation, even though it's, it's not in person, but nevertheless, it's a great opportunity to present some of our recent work. <laughs> it's on, it will be on method development in DFT, in particular in the cone sham formalism and we will consider two subjects one is exact exchange the treatment of exact exchange in cone sham in the cone sham formalism if the temperature is not at zero kelvin but at some finite temperature and the second part will be on correlation and here we will in particular consider correlation energy and how it can be treated within the adiabatic connection dissipation fluctuation theorem so now i have to see whether i can <laughs> no this is can you see now the second uh, view graph <laughs> okay <clears throat> so uh, first uh, a brief overview i will give a certain introduction to orbital dependent functionals in cone sham formalism and dft that's a little bit of the philosophy we are pursuing and then we will come first to the exact exchange part, consider how um, non-zero temperature can be included. And we will do, uh, consider one example that's a topological phase transition in a material that's driven exclusively by the electronic temperature. And then the second part of the talk will, the, uh, will be the adiabatic connection fluctuation dissipation theorem. And then I'll um, introduce a certain class of functionals we call sigma functionals which we think um, are a very good compromise between accuracy and uh, computational effort. So let's start a little bit with the, the cone sham formalism and, and our philosophy. I'm sure you all heard about density functional theory and, and know about the cone sham formalism. Nevertheless, let me start very basic. So we have some electronic system. By the way, can you see my, my pointer? <laughs> Mm, yes, yes. Okay. Your okay, great, right. So like always, if we have an electronic system, it's kind of defined, our problem is defined by the, if we do it non-relativistically, by the Schrodinger equation. So we have kinetic energy, electron-electron interaction, and some external potential, usually the potential of the nucleus. Then in principle, though not in practice, except for very small systems, we can solve the Schrodinger equation, get the ground state, and get the electron density from it. And then the hohenberg cohn theorem tells us the ground state electron density determines the Hamiltonian, even if we did not knew the Hamiltonian in the beginning and we would just have the ground state electron density, then in principle, we would know the Hamiltonian. This is trivial for the first two parts, the kinetic energy and the electron-electron interaction. Because if you know the electron density, you can integrate it, you get the particle number, and if you have the number of electrons, well, then in each electronic system, kinetic energy and electron-electron interaction is the same. The, the key point is the external potential, and there 
I mean, I will not going to repeat the, the proof of holmberg cohn It's a uniqueness theorem. It tells you for a given ground state electron density, there can be only one external potential. We have to qualify that uh, so far that just adding a constant would not be considered as an extra uh, potential. So it's unique up to an additive constant. Okay, so far, this is our, our interacting system. And now you could start doing, or this would be a justification to doing um, density functional theory in the Thomas Fermi sense, because you now can argue, okay, the electron density determines the Hamiltonian, and that means it determines everything, because the Hamiltonian in the end determines everything. And that means it not only determines the ground state, wave function, ground state energy, in principle, also all excited state, uh, state energies and so on. And of course, this is very attractive and you often read in textbooks yeah, in DFT, you replace wave functions by the density. This was true if you really would do something like Thomas Fermi and beyond, which is nowadays uh, called orbital free DFT. And that's an interesting um, line of research. We are not pursuing this. And I think it's fair to say while there is, is progress, Still, 99% of all electronic structure calculations are not done via the Thomas Fermi or the orbital free rate uh, because it's still not accurate enough for most purposes. That's where the cone sham formalism comes in. Now, we introduce a second electronic system, which is not a real electronic system. It, it is one that consists of non-interacting electrons. Of course, true electrons are interacting, but you can make model electrons, which, and this is important, still are fermions and have all properties of electrons, except that they don't interact. Then the, the Hamiltonian operator becomes very simple. It's just kinetic energy and some effective potential. And because there's no coupling of, of the particles, it decouples in one electron equations. You immediately get orbitals or one electron states, and you can build a Slater determinant, the cone sham determinant. And now the relation to the real system is that our cone sham system must have the same ground state electron uh, density. The whole uh, cone theorem then tells us that, there, that the, the cone sham system is unique. It actually does not tell us that it exists. This is kind of an assumption we have to make, but it is uh, usually not a problem. <clears throat> but if it exists, it's unique, again, up to an additive <laughs> constant. And what we now, in, in, to more or less extent, are doing, we are starting from this cone sham determinant or wave function. And we can, in, in, a, in a first step, consider this as an approximation to the true wave function, we can, even though we got it from something that's non-interacting, we can take this wave function and evaluate the complete, the, the, the full Hamiltonian, the, the energy that we get from the cone sham determinant. This gives us already most parts of the energy except the correlation energy. This we have to do, do extra. Okay, so now let's see what we, in this scheme, what we get exactly and what do we have to approximate. This is now the ground state energy and all the blue parts is what we get if we take the Hamiltonian, the true Hamiltonian of our system and take the energy expectation value with the cone sham wave function. This blue things is exactly in terms of orbitals what you evaluate if you do a Hartree-Fock calculation. The only difference is the orbitals that go into these expressions are now cone sham orbitals. But we can calculate all of that exact, including the exchange energy. Because this is simply the exchange energy that looks like the exchange energy in Hartree-Fock, except that we use other orbitals to evaluate it. The only thing we really have to um, approximate is the correlation energy. This is all the remainder. In classical or standard DFT methods, one usually does not calculate the exchange energy exactly, even though one could easily do that. The reason is twofold. One is one wants to exploit error cancellations between exchange and correlation. So if you do exchange exactly, then you see all the errors in the correlation. So this is error, if you do it the way we are doing it here, that we really treat everything we can treat exactly, we treat exactly, then of course we can no longer benefit from error cancellations. But of course, on the other hand, we do, so to speak, the exchange, which typically is larger than, than correlation exactly. And it's, uh, it's a bit maybe a more systematic way to proceed. 
The second reason is, of course, you need the cone sham orbital somewhere. I told you that, that um, the, the cone sham Hamiltonian decouples in one particle equations for the orbitals, but you need the effective potential. And the effective potential is the external potential, typically the potential of the nuclei, the Hartree potential, the exchange potential, and the correlation potential. And these are defined as functional derivatives of the energy, of the corresponding energy. So if you want to have the exact cone sham exchange potential, you have to take the functional derivative with respect to the electron density of the exchange energy. If you now know the exchange energy only in terms of the orbitals, then this is not straightforward. And we will look at this, how we are going to do this. If on the other hand, I have some approximation for the exchange energy in terms of some density GG, or if it's a GGA of the density and gradients of the density, then if it's a dif differentiable expression, I can straightforwardly do this. And this is the second reason, because if you treat exchange exactly, it's not that straightforward to do the exchange potential, the consistent one also exactly. Okay, then let's now um, proceed first with the exchange part. So doing the energy exactly is, is, is kind of trivial, but the exchange potential is not. So this is on, on, on the next transparency here. here. Okay, the exchange energy here, this is the standard expression for the exchange energy of a Slater determinant. You sum over the, the orbitals, these two electron integrals. And now what we need is, we need the exchange potential. So we need the derivative in principle, because the density determines all the Hamiltonians, the exact one like the cone sham Hamiltonian. It also determines all the orbitals, <clears throat> that means the orbitals are functionals of the electron density. And in principle, we could do the, the chain rule. We take the derivative of this expression with respect to the orbitals, and then the derivative of the orbitals with respect to the density. But the second part, we cannot do in practice because we don't know how the orbitals depend on the electron density. So there we are blocked. But what we can do is, and <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> This requires a bit a change of perspective. We have seen the electron density determines the Hamiltonians, and that means also the, via the hohn beck theorem, the effective potential. But on the other hand, <coughs> sorry, if you have the external potential or, in this, or the cone sham potential, then you can get the orbitals and from that the density. So instead of using the electron density as basic variable, which is a traditional way in DFT, we could as well use the effective potential as basic variable. And if we do this, we can now take the derivative, the functional derivative of the exchange energy with respect to the effective cone sham potential. And we do this in two different ways. In the first, we do it here on the left side, we two, they take the functional derivative of the energy with respect to the electron density, and then with the chain rule, energy uh, the density with respect to the effective potential. The first quantity is the quantity we are interested in. This is by definition the exchange potential. This is what we want to have. The second one tells us how does the density change in first order if we change the effective potential. This is nothing else than the cone sham response, the static cone sham response function. And because it's a non-interacting non system, we know how this looks like. It's just standard perturbation theory that gives you, if you have a non-interacting system, if you change the potential, how the electron density is changing. It's here given by a sum over state expression. One might think, okay, this comes from perturbation theory. There is some approximation involved, but that's not because what we want here is a first order quantity. We want the derivative. So perturbation theory gives us exactly this first order quantity. And so we, we have this part here, this is what we want. And now we take the same functional derivative in a somewhat different way. We first take the derivative of the energy with respect to the orbitals, because we have the expression explicitly in terms of the orbitals, we can take this functional derivative. And then we take the functional derivative of the orbitals with respect to the effective potential. This is something which we again know from perturbation theory. It's again textbook perturbation theory. And this results in this uh, expression here. So in the end, we have an integral equation, which is called 
optimized effective uh, potential equation for the quantity we are interested. So if we now go from a, let's say, standard DFT um, or corn sham calculation with some a generalized gradient approximation functional, then there's always a step in, in the, in the self-consistency in the SCF process where we have to evaluate the potential. And then in the, in the standard conventional DFT, you take, you calculate from the orbitals the electron density, and then you plug it in some expression of, of the electron density, which is the, uh, of, of the exchange potential as functional of the electron density. And this step you have to replace by solving this integral equation. Typically, you do this by introducing an auxiliary basis set. I mean, you have typically a basis set for your orbitals, could be plane waves in solids or Gaussian functions in molecules, or you can also choose other basis sets if you want. And then you need a second basis set, which you use to represent here the response function and the potential. Then this becomes a matrix equation and it's readily solved. So um, for computation, Otherwise, this is not a very expensive step. It's, it's quite easy to do. It is a bit tricky with respect to the numerical stability. You have to balance the two basis sets, the auxiliary one for the, for, to represent the exchange potential and the one for the orbitals. And this has to be done with certain care. Otherwise, um, you can get um, unphysical results. Okay, so what do you gain by doing this? The first thing is, if you then consider the energy, let's assume we do a, an exchange only calculation. So we neglect correlation for a second, but we do the exchange exactly in the cone sham sense. So we are working with a local multiplicative exchange potential. And then we compare to Hartree Fock, then the energies are almost identical. So you can say, why doing it? And it's true, what typically is not doing this to just replace Hartree Fock. But it is, the energy is a starting point for methods where you then afterwards treat the correlation, for example, by the adiabatic connection fluctuation dissipation theory. This we will consider a little bit later. But even if you stay at the exact exchange level, there is something that's very different from hartree fock and also from conventional cone sham methods. And that's the one particle spectrum, which for example, you. Um, need if you if you want to do a band structure calculation. But let's first consider a simple molecule and what is shown here is a methane molecule and it's what's depicted here are the valence orbitals. So on the left it's exact exchange, on the right it's a uh, conventional GGA, this is uh, Purdue Berg Ernsthoff functional. And here you see the orbitals, these are, are the four only valence orbitals, these are the four bonding orbitals, they are occupied, and then you have also four antibonding orbitals. And this is not shown here. If you do an exact exchange calculation, you also get a complete Rydberg series. If you now do a GGA calculation, well, then the occupied orbitals look relatively similar, but you can already see their eigenvalues are much higher in energy. And this is because the exact exchange is a self-interaction free method because exchange is exactly what cancels the Coulomb uh, self-interactions, whereas a GGA calculation is not. And there is a theorem in, in a cone sham that the highest occupied orbital should be equal to the ionization potential. And this is fairly good obeyed in an exact exchange procedure, but very bad in a GGA procedure. Furthermore, you see the unoccupied orbitals, they look strange here. Indeed, you don't have nice um, anti-bonding orbitals, only one of them is, is negative, the rest is positive, so it's an unbound orbital, so this is not really well defined here in, in a Gaussian basis set, and you certainly don't get an, um, a Rydberg series because the asymptotic of the potential is not correct. So if you want to have good orbitals, then you have to go to something like these exact exchange um, um, approaches, and of course one can say this is a maybe also a bit a point of philosophy. Often in textbooks you read, well, the cone sham orbitals have no meaning. They're just there to, to get the electron density. This statement is plainly wrong because maybe I go briefly back to when we introduced here the orbital dependent functionals. 
then I told you exchange often is, is evaluated via an approximate density functional. But what is never evaluated by an approximate density functional, because then it wouldn't be cone sham anymore, is the kinetic energy here. The, 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 this is what's called the non-interacting kinetic energy, which is a little bit of a strange name because the kinetic energy is always non-interacting. But what is meant here, this is the kinetic energy of the cone sham system. It's not the exact kinetic energy. There's a little bit missing. This is in the, in the correlation. But the crucial point is, in cone sham, you need the orbitals. They are not just auxiliary quantities to get the electron density. You need them, and this is the most or an equally important point, to evaluate this part of the kinetic energy. This is why cone sham works and gives quite accurate results, whereas orbital-free methods always suffer. They, they really try to, to get this part of the energy via the electron density, but this is a very hard business. And this is what makes things difficult in orbital uh, free DFT. And this is what makes cone sham working. So orbitals are important in cone sham and actually they're at the heart of cone sham. This is why cone sham works. And later on, we will use orbitals in, in, uh, to, to evaluate or to, to construct the correlation functionals and then of course also orbitals are important and there also the eigenvalues are important so in that sense if we go back to this point here orbitals are important in cone sham and also if you do response properties then typically you have eigenvalue uh, differences in time dependent dft and all this belongs on orbitals and if you have qualitatively wrong orbitals then you start from a qualitatively wrong starting point and and Therefore, um, we believe that having something that with exact exchange at least have, has a qualitative correct starting um, yeah, uh, uh, spectrum of uh, orbitals and eigenvalues is a valuable thing. Good. Now let's come to the point if we want to generalize this to non-zero temperatures. Then again, we have our Hamiltonian here, but now we are not solving for wave functions. Uh, what we are doing, if we are interested in the ground state, we need um, we need the density matrix, and we if you have uh, at zero temperature, you can do an, an energy minimization from the variational principle to get the ground state wave function, and here we do a minimization to get uh, the ground state density uh, matrix. And what we have to minimize in this case is is not just the the energy. We have we take the grand potential, so we have an an entropy term and, and we have here a term for the particle with the uh, chemical potential that takes into account uh, the number of particles here. But except for that, we can do what we always do in cone sham. We have here, so to speak, what we should do if we want to have the exact solution, but we cannot do it straightforward. So we introduce our cone sham system, which again is a system of non-interacting electrons here. And again, the Hamiltonian here decomposes. We can immediately get orbitals and eigenvalues. And then if we have a temperature, we can simply construct the corresponding um, cone sham density matrix. So now, like before, we, among other things, need the effective potential. To that end, we need a Hartree potential and we need an exchange potential. Correlation, for a moment, let's, let's uh, disregard that. So we need... And again, this is the functional derivative, the exchange potential of the exchange energy. And the exchange energy, in a sense, is again very similar to what we had in the, in the zero temperature formalism. It's just we now, instead of the taking the expectation value of the cone sham determinant with the electron-electron interaction, well, we take the trace of our density matrix with the electron-electron interaction. This gives us the con complete electron electron interaction energy of the cone sham system we have to subtract the Hartree part and then we get the exchange energy and it basically looks like before except that we have now occupation numbers here and then the rest is quite straightforward you have here now the energy it now contains um, occupation numbers in the usual way Boltzmann factors that contain an energy and a chemical potential here I mean, this is the energy eigenvalue of the orbitals. We again can set up in exactly the same way this OEP equation. It's just if we now consider the response matrix, 
or the response function, the cone sham response function. It contains, of course, these, these occupation numbers and it contains terms from the derivative of the occupation numbers. This is because if you change the effective potential, you change the orbitals and also their eigenvalues. And if you change their eigenvalues, you change their occupations for a given temperature. And, and if you if um, the occupation changes, you also have to reevaluate the, uh, the chemical potential. So you get these extra terms and you get them here in the, in the response function as well as on the right hand side. But except for that, it's all the same. So you can do this. Now the question is, what is the effect of taking temperature into account? I have to say, we're normally not into temperature. We, we started this from a purely technical uh, reason. We, we have a self-written plane wave code where we do all sorts of experiments in to do, introduce new functionals and things like this. And this we used uh, to do exact exchange calculations. And in the beginning, we always were considering um, semiconductors or isolators. And at some point we thought, okay, now we have the methods, why not looking into, into metals? But in metals, to get your SCF procedure converging, you, have, you need some broadening of your, your uh, levels. This is in all codes like VAST, you find this, there are different ways. You can simply take a Gaussian function to broad all your levels or whatever. But then we thought, okay, if we need some broadening scheme, why not do it, doing it the physical way? Let's introduce temperature and we introduce temperature just to have a physical broadening scheme. And then we just calculated metals, but we couldn't do much more with it because typically if you have a semiconductor with, which has a band gap of several electron volt, then the electronic temperature, I mean, KT is so much smaller than, than a few EV that at ambient um, condition, and even if you heat your, 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 um, your semiconductor up to a couple of hundred uh, degrees Celsius, it's still like that. So electronic temperature has very, very little effect on, on most properties. So we then did a little bit, but very little in, in warm, dense matter. We were invited to, to use this there and we did a few calculations, but basically we did not use it except as a broadening scheme. But then where it's really useful is when these topological um, uh, insulators came up, because there you have always very delicate uh, things in your band structure, like, like a Dirac point or something like this. And this can, is, is, so to speak, easily changed by everything. And this is, so to speak, something where, where electronic temperature can have an effect. And this is something we were then exploring. And this is the this is um, here an example. This is the band structure of a material uh, of, of zinc blender uh, structure. It, it's gallium bismuth. And what's shown here first is that we consider this as a band structure at different temperatures. And we took here LDA, we could have taken any GGA, whatever, doesn't matter, some, some standard functional, and here an exact exchange only calculation. And we can, uh, we, we, here display the band structures in two ways. This left is a traditional way, so the Fermi energy is zero of the energy scale. And in the other case, we put the zero, and, and the, the typical thing here is they have a quadratic band touching here. So a band from here and here a touch, in a, uh, and, and this here is a quadratic function. And, and we put this quadratic band touching for the different temperatures is here from 300 to 10,000 at zero, because then you can directly compare the form of the, of the bands. And what you see here in the LDA case, well, the form, except if you go then to high temperatures like 10,000 and 1,000, then something happens. But at lower temperatures here, they are all just on top of each other. And in any case, the form is very, very sim similar. And that's a typical thing because an LDA or a GGA functional, well, how can temperature into, uh, go into that? There is no explicit temperature dependent in, in the LDA. The only thing is that the electron density, if you calculate it, well, then you have occupation numbers and via the occupation numbers, the density may change somewhat, but this change is relatively mild. And then also your, your potential and then the band structure changes. But this is a relatively small, or, or indirect way, and, and it's, 
typically the band structures do not show much response on, on temperature. If you then, what, what happens is the Fermi energy shifts because if you occupy and, and your, your levels are not symmetrically around the Fermi level and you do, an, in, in, if you introduce temperature and, and, and um, corresponding occupation numbers, you always have to adapt your chemical potential and that means your, your Fermi energy. So they just shift it a little bit against each other, but the form is more or less the same. Okay, if you now do the same with exact exchange, then in the functional, you have explicitly your, your occupation number. So the functional is explicitly um, temperature dependent and you have to take the derivatives with respect to the occupation numbers. And then again, it's not here, not a qualitative change, but you see that even here, there is a much uh, stronger variation than in the case without um, this exact exchange. And these are relatively high temperatures. If you now look at the same material at very low temperatures, so now we are at 100 and 500 um, Kelvin, then the, at 100 Kelvin, you have a phase transition where you had before, if you go up here, this is really a quadratic band touching. So this is one band coming here, another coming from here, and they touch in this point. They have one point where it's a, sem a semi-metal. But here, first of all, you get a splitting. It now becomes magnetic, the material uh, at 100 Kelvin. And you have here these flat bands, so you no longer have a touching. So this is a really, it is a, now you have, a, this is a phase transition to, an, to a different type of material. It, it no longer has a quadratic band um, touching and it's a, a spin polarized material. And then if you, and, and this is something, this is a qualitative change and you don't get it if you do an LDA or GGA calculation. You can of course ask, is this a pure artifact of exact exchange? Because I mean, we have neglected correlation. What we can do to mimic this is that we screen in the exchange, the electron-electron interaction. This is so to speak a poor man's approach to include qualitatively the effect of correlation. And if you do this, even for relatively strong screenings, you can see that qualitatively there is no change. And then it, it goes even, it is even more complicated. If you go to, to lower temperatures, then you get a second phase transition. Then you again get, uh, get here some crossing. This is, if you analyze it, this is what's called a while point. So you have here effects in the electronic uh, structure that are only, or temperature effects that qualitatively change the material, but you only see them if you go to an exact treatment of exchange, you will not see this in standard uh, DFT methods. Of course, we have now concentrated completely on the electronic temperature. At the same time, of course, your, your nuclei will move, you will have phonons. This is the second effect, which we did not take into account at all here, but this is in a bit a different approach than most others. What is very often done, or not very often, but what after these topological materials came up, then the first thing to go beyond zero temperature calculations were to introduce some electron phonon coupling. And this is of course important, but what we could show here is that it's equally important or at least something you should not neglect in these, these very delicate materials is the effect of electronic temperature because this example shows you that electronic temperature alone can drive a phase transition. So if we <coughs> summarize this part of, of the talk, <coughs> Then what we've seen is that if you include temperature in exact exchange, you get the temperature dependent occupation numbers. So your functional is explicitly temperature dependent. If you take uh, the functional derivative to, to get the potential, then you have to take all the functional derivatives with respect to occupation numbers. And this means you have a stronger dependence on, for example, band structures on temperature than in LDA or GGA functionals. Okay, then let's now come to the second part of the talk. This is how do, can we treat correlation? This will be now at, at zero, again at zero temperature. So we now want to treat exchange exactly, but then we, the simple thing is to say, okay, then just add some traditional a GGA functional for the correlation, but as mentioned, this is not working because 
uh, these functionals only work if they can uh, rely on error cancellations, which we no longer have because we treat exchange exactly. Then you have here this, what's called the adiabatic connection fluctuation dissipation theorem. It was derived by Purdue and, and Lankres almost 50 years or 45 years ago. It then wasn't used much for 25 years and in the last 15, 20 years, it is, it is used to, to generate or, or develop from it um, correlation functionals. Let's, it, it looks a bit uh, yeah, complicated. You have an uh, integration over a coupling constant over a complex frequencies. And what you have in here, the, the key ingredients are two response functions. Again, response functions, you want to know, I change an external potential. How does the electron density change? But now we do this frequency dependent. So we have a frequency dependent change of the potential. And we have here the cone sham response function. This is something we know from the orbitals. We can construct it. And we have the response function of an interacting system. And here's this coupling constant. So we are not only considering the physical system, which is fully interacting, then this alpha would be one, but we also are considering systems in between. So in the beginning, we had only the cone sham system, completely non-interacting and the fully interacting system, but now we consider systems in between. At each point, the hohenberg cone theorem tells us there can be only one effective potential that gives us a ground state that has the same electron density than the real system and then also like the cone sham system. So along this, what's called the adiabatic connection, all our systems have the same ground state electron um, density. This is what relates them. Okay, now the question is, what does this integration here over frequency is doing? And then we have here an integration over the Coulomb kernel. This is quite easily seen. Here, this part is written again. G is now, it does not need to be necessarily the the electron-electron interaction. It's, it's some um, two-electron interaction. And let's consider this response function. If we would know all the eigenstates of our system, which of course we don't, but for developing the formalism, we can assume that, then we can again write a simple sum over state here, uh, expression for it. It's just all here, the ground states. It's, it's, it's just, um, again, uh, first order perturbation theories. But of course we need all, all the states, the many body states of our system. And this is just the density operator. This is done here for, for real valued wave function, but it works as well as for complex valued one, then you get a somewhat more, more complicated energy factor. But here it's, it's very nice to see in this case, this energy um, expression has exactly this form. And if you integrate now over the frequency, you just get pi half. So the role of this frequency integration is that all the energies vanish. And what you're left with, it's something where you have here simply a sum over states. The ground state is missing, but we can add it. And then this is an identity operator. We can cross it out. And then we just have a product of density operators, which we evaluate for the ground state. This gives us just the pair density of our system. We get, because we added here the ground state, that we had to subtract that term. And this, if this is ground state and ground state, this is just twice the electron density. And then, then we get one other term. This comes from the fact here if you have here the density operator and multiply it with the density operator here, then this is the sum of delta functions for each particle, and this again. And it can, it can happen that you get a delta function here for particle, let's say one, and again for particle one. This is something that does not contribute to the pair density. It's an unphysical um, contribution. And this gives this somewhat strange part here. But the key point is in here, we have a quantity we are interested in. This is the pair density. And now we subtract two response functions and they have the same electron density. So all the density dependent term, if we take the difference drop out and what remains is the pair density of our interacting system minus the pair density of the interact, non-interacting system. And then we take from that uh, the, the contraction with the Coulomb energy. So we simply, get the difference in the Coulomb energy of these two, um, of, of, of the cone sham system and of our interacting system. And that by definition is the electron-electron contribution to correlation for our partially um, 
um, interacting system. So this is a part of what we want to get. What we not yet have is a is the kinetic energy contribution to the um, correlation energy. And this we get from this coupling constant part, because what we can show is if you take the function, uh, the, the derivative of the exchange energy with respect to the coupling constant, it follows directly from the Hellman Feynman theorem. This is then you get the electron electron contribution. So if this means reversely, if you integrate over the electron electron contribution, then you get the uh, correlation energy. Okay. So if you want to see this derivation in more detail, you can look into this paper. This is a bit review like. And it's, it's, I mean, there are various ways to derive the adiabatic connection fluctuation dissipation theorem, but I think this is a very straightforward and simple way to do this because you basically only need to know this relatively trivial integral here. The rest is, is quite simple. Okay, now we want to, to use that. Okay, this is again our theorem. This part we know as a sum over state expression. What we then again do, we introduce an auxiliary basis set. Then this function becomes a matrix. Also this here, this kernel becomes a matrix. And in principle also, or not in principle, also in practice, this here also becomes a matrix. And then this integral becomes simply taking the trace. So this is what we really want to do. This part we know, this part of course we also know. It. But the key point is of course the interacting response function. If we would knew this, if we knew this exactly, then everything would be exact. And typically, we get this from time-dependent DFT. And in time-dependent DFT, you get the response function, the interacting response function from the non-interacting response function via this Dyson type equation. And what you need is the what's called the kernel. This is a functional derivative of the Hartree potential, the exchange potential, and the correlation potential. And this, up to now, everything was exact. And now the various methods start to, to distinguish from each other by the way we are, uh, what type of, of approximation we introduce here. And the simplest thing you can do is, OK, this is again our, our Dyson equation. We now have to approximate this. We know the Hartree kernel. And the problematic parts are the exchange and the correlation kernel. And now we do something that neither in physics nor in, in real life usually works. We simply ignore the, prob the problem. This is we neglect exchange and correlation. So we, we just take the Hartree kernel. If we do this, then we know everything. And that's what's called the random or direct random phase approximation. You pay for just ignoring the problems. This is, it's, it has some unphysical self-interaction. So if you calculate a one electron system, you get a correlation energy, which is of course nonsense. The correlation energy is strongly overestimated in magnitude. And as a result, you have relatively poor atomization energies of molecules. But what is nice, you can treat dispersion interactions, van der Waals. This is smoothly done. And you get moderately good reaction, isomerization, transition state energies of molecules. But so far, I think there is not much market. It's not used that much. A lot of codes now have uh, RPA options, but typically in applications, it's not used much because there's simply no niche where, you, uh, where this is, has some unique um, advantages because dispersion you can also do in, in this muller placid perturbation theory, or you have the semi-empirical. Um, corrections and if you if you go to some more advanced yeah let's say um, meta ggas or or hybrid functionals you get equally good reaction energies and isomerization energy so we have to improve upon it and this is what i'm going to present here for this we have to briefly look into a little bit how we do this in practice so again this is our our starting point the adiabatic connection fluctuation dissipation theorem this is now our expression for the interacting response function only with the, with the Hartree kernel. And now we substitute this in, in here. If we do this, we get here this expression. We can factor the, the, the non-interacting response function here out. OK, now I told you in practice, no, I didn't tell you, but I'm, I'm telling you now. 
what typically we we also normalize our auxiliary basis set with respect to the Coulomb kernel. Then the Coulomb kernel becomes a unit matrix. I, I put it here in the formulas because that we see where it is, but in practice, this is a unit matrix. And then the only quantity in here is the response function. And we now diagonalize that. And then we plug this diagonalized form in here. And then we can, can massage it a little bit. Then here, this is a diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues. And this here are the matrices that contain the eigenvectors. These are unitary matrices. But they all drop out. In the end, you get an expression that only depends on the eigenvalues of your non-interacting response function in this relatively simple way. You even can do the, the coupling constant integration um, analytically. And this is highly attractive because technically what you need to do, writing in direct RPA code is very is, is a very short thing and you can do it very ra um, rapidly if you have all the integrals, which you in typical codes you all have. You construct from the sum over state expression your response function for all the frequencies you need, the frequency integration is done numerically. Well, then you diagonalize it, you get your eigenvalues, well, and then you evaluate this expression here and you sum in some numerical integration scheme, you typically need 30 to 50 points. You do this 50 times for the different frequencies, you sum the energy contributions up and you have your, your energy here. So this is highly efficient and, and simple to do. What we now want to do is, we want to modify this simple scheme such that it becomes much more accurate. And what we do is we rewrite this, what you have here, this basically is a function of your sigmas, of your eigenvalues. Okay, and this is now written here again. We write this, this is a function of the eigenvalues. If we use the one from the page before, we are doing RPA. We can do, do then the, the frequency integration, uh, the, the, the coupling constraint uh, strength integration, analytically then we get again a function only of, of our eigenvalues. And now what we are going to do is we replace this function by something that's going to be more accurate. And this we will do by optimizing this function for a certain training set. Of course you can ask what is the, what is the justification for, for modifying this function. And I, due to, to time reasons I will do this quite briefly. To that end we consider a little bit again our, our um, time dependent DFT equation here. This is how we want to get the, the interacting response function and we want of course to, to approximate our, our kernel here by something as simple as possible. But we start by expanding this kernel with respect to the coupling constraints, the coupling strengths. Okay so we get here a Taylor series. And we also take an expansion of the um, interacting response function. At that point, you can say, okay, if, and, and, or let's point to something else before. This here, the individual terms are hard to construct. There is no easy way, they are not easily accessible. Those here are accessible in a straightforward but very cumbersome way. So these expressions are becoming more and more complicated. So effectively you can do it up to the first term. Now you could say, okay, why using time dependent DFT at all if I can directly take, make a perturbation series of the quantity I'm interested in. Indeed one can do this, but because it is becoming um, outrageously complicated, like always in perturbation theory, you have to stop at the first term here. And if you only use these two, the leading term and the first order term, the results are very poor. This is because you then really have your, your interaction only in leading order. This is a nice thing in, in what you have here in time dependent DFT. This here is nothing else than a summed up geometric series. So even if you take something very simple here, as long as you have some alpha dependence, some dependence on the coupling strengths here, you get it via this, if you, if you expand this in, a, in a, a geometric series, you can get the coupling strengths to all orders. And this is what you need. So what we now do is we consider the relation between those two um, expansions. And it works like this, the first order t, uh, term exchange here is given 
by the first order term here and you have to multiply with a non-interacting response function. And something like this happens in each order. And as a matter of fact, you see, you always get these red terms, which are, if you consider this part, are always simple products here. So this is again, something like, like a geometric series with alternating uh, sign here. And then of course you get other terms. And there are those in practice we cannot access. In principle, we could go on in perturbation theory. So what we now do is we say, okay, let's only take these red terms in principle to arbitrary uh, order and neglect all those. This is then given, oops, given here. And we renormalize the coefficients here. So instead of just minus plus, we do some renormalization coefficient that then may take into account to some extent the terms we neglected. Here, we can also rewrite this because here the, the heart rate exchange part can, is given exactly by this part. So we can substitute this in here. So we get an expansion of our heart rate exchange correlation term a kernel in terms of the just Hartree exchange part. And this part we still can do exactly because we've access to this. Now we want, and this is one way we pursued, I don't have time to talk about it. This then immediately you have a self-interaction free um, method because you, you include exchange and also you get quite good energies, but this here evaluating this in practice is relatively complicated. So the method is, not that cheap computationally. To make it cheap computationally, we do one further approximation. We, we have now this expansion here. And the next step is that we simply, again, neglect the exchange part that we write this expansion simply in terms only of the Hartree kernel. Now you, we have a model of our full Hartree exchange correlation kernel in terms of the Hartree kernel. And then Again, if you use that in practice, this is a unit matrix, you diagonalize this, you can put this in here, you put it in your adiabatic connection fluctuation um, theorem. And then what you get is like before an expression for the, for the energy, but this function now is no longer the, the simple RPA function. It's a more complicated function. Actually, it's a Taylor series. The first two terms are RPA, and now we just have more terms. And now what we can do is we can try to approximate these or to fit coefficients here. Actually, this is, this is one way you, would, you, you could stop the Taylor series at some point and then try to optimize these coefficients. Or you say, okay, if this thing here converges, then it defines a function and, we, and this is what we did. We then try to directly optimize this function. And this was done, okay, here this just tells the approximations which we have done. We neglected in the expansion terms and then we, then we uh, uh, neglected the exchange contributions. And we will do, in addition, we will do this post self-consistent. So we will generate the orbitals, let's say by a PBE method or by some standard DFT method and ju just evaluate the energy afterwards. So then we parametrized our functional. We need some representation of our sigma function. We used cubic splines, but we also tried other things. It doesn't really matter. Cubic splines are just convenient. And then we have, which probably looks a bit strange here, we have all sorts of test sets. These are sets of molecules, which in those cases where either you, you back calculate uh, quantities from experiment, but here, is this done by very high level, very expensive calculations. The first sets are atomization energies. Those are not maybe not the most interesting thing, but what is really interesting if you do chemistry, then are, and these are those test sets here, these are reaction energies between molecules. These are transition states. If you go from one, from edicts to products in between uh, the, uh, this here, and this here are geometries or, or pairing energies that are of molecules that are bond by van der Waals. And what we then we used some of these sets for, for, for constructing our function and other are just for tests. The first thing we did is we just use these reaction energies here. This is a set V stand, the W stands for Weizmann. It's about 130 molecules. You can make 10,000 reactions out of them. And then 
you can check how good they are. This is in average, and the, the unity is kcal. This is a bit strange unit for physicists, but chemists usually use that. So um, a kcal, uh, 20 kcal are roughly one electron volt. And there is a quantity that's called chemi chemical accuracy. This is what your experimental partners want you to calculate up to the accuracy. And this is roughly one kcal per mole. And this here is clearly PBE does only six. RPA is somewhat better if you would use some more advanced a meta GGA or a, or a hybrid functional, you would probably come close to that, but it's still, it's, it's far beyond um, from uh, chemical accuracy. And we used only that for training or for constructing our function. And then of course, if, if you use that, then we improve drastically. But, and this is an important point, we also improved on all, basically all other test sets, which were not used to construct the functional. And if you, if you compare, let's say from RPA, which is our starting point, if you want to, to what we have here, we get quite drastic improvements. And in total, we are now reached the goal we wanted. I mean, not for atomization energies, that is clear because this is an, an uh, extensive quantity. The larger your molecule, the larger the atomization energy, the larger the error. I mean, this you can, this is, is, you have no chance to get this under one kcal, but this is a quantity not really needed very often in, in chemistry. These are reactions, barriers, geometries, uh, thing. I mean, this is again, not the geometry is, this is the energy of the pairing energy of, of, of molecules that interact via van der Waals or, or um, uh, yeah, mostly via dispersion inter interactions. You can then say how robust is the procedure. So we, we used a lot of other, we did an average of, of various of these test systems here. So, so this is now a very different way to, 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 to construct um, or very different reference, but it does not change at all. You can also use more cubic splines. It again changes very little. And this chain here, the, the biggest change, this is probably more numerics that do, do something. If you look at this, sigma function, this is the, the RPA function, and this is, so to speak, the constructed function, and the basic thing, it, it always has a feature here, and this improves drastically the energies. And what you see here, one of the lines you can't see because it's under the other, so it, it, this is the two where we changed the reference sets to construct, but it has no influence here. You can then also compare with, with other methods. We already showed you uh, already showed you comparisons with PBE and RPA, but you can also compare with the meta GGA or with B3LIP. That's a hybrid functional, and the sigma functional is almost always better. Or in those cases here, sometimes for individual individual sets, this maybe this is a little bit better than here. But then you have very very uh, strong fluctuations, whereas this is typically is relatively uh, evenly distributed. Here, this is a, a hybrid function, um, a double hybrid function. This is relatively expensive, and this is consistently better in atomization energies, but not in the other quantities. You can also see on this view graph the limits of our approach, and this is the last things here. These are ionization potentials and electron affinities. They are always a problem for anything that is based on RPA because we have this self-interaction problem and we cannot get completely rid of it. And actually we did in the construction, we didn't use this at all. And this is something you always overestimate because you, you, you don't have, have exchange you overestimate the magnitude of the correlation. But the magnitude of the correlation, again, is an extensive quantity. It grows with the number of particles. And in all these sets here, <coughs> we do not change the number of electrons. Even in atomization energies, you change the number of molecules, as you also do sometimes in, in reactions, but the number of electrons is the same. But here you change the number of electrons, and this is something that's beyond the reach of, of this function. It's if you include the exchange kernel, you get them automatically very, very accurate because then you have a self-interaction free method. So this is kind of the limits. But other things, okay, here we briefly see the performance RPA towards our sigma functional for this W4 
set for these 10,000 reactions and it works exactly as you want it to be. Both are kind of, uh, kind of Gaussian-like error distributions, but the one with the sigma function is much more narrow. And this means you have all these outliers, which is what you don't like to have because this destroys your predictive power. Power, if you make a prediction that's wrong by 10 kcal or here even it goes up to 15, it's worthless. And here these outliers are, are much more limited in, in range. So, so, so the error here, is, it's, it's more than one kcal, but at least it, it's bound to about five kcal. So this is a clear improvement here. Also other quantities which were not used at all in the in the construction, these are geometries. Let's go <coughs> through this fast. This is a mean average error. They're relatively accurate even on the standard PBE or RPA level, but you always improve with these sigma functionals. Here, here this is bond angles. These are non-covalently bounded dimers. They have very long bond distances, so the errors here are larger. But again, we, we, we are, are much better than this with standard methods. Here you need for PBE, you cannot treat in a simple PBE non-covalently bond molecules. You need some, some empirical correction, but even then it's clearly worse than what we get. And these are harmonic vibrational frequencies of small molecules. Those you need for infrared spectroscopy or Raman spectroscopy. And again, we get uh, much improvement here. So this is consistently better. And then the nice thing is if you look at the computational price for these functionals, and these are two different basis sets. This is a larger basis set. This is a smaller one. This is not important here. And as reference, we took a Hartree-Fock calculation. Hartree-Fock is somewhat more expensive than a PBE calculation, but it's about the computational effort or a little less than this of a hybrid calculation. So if you're willing, and this these three lip calculations, for example, are kind of routinely done. And if you do, do these, and then after you finished your calculation, you take the orbitals and eigenvalues, and you re-evaluate your energies with these sigma functionals, then if you compare here green and, and this yellow, then this is less than half the time. So it's not very expensive. So if you can do your standard calculation and you're willing to invest 50% more computational time, you can make your calculation by a factor of two or three more accurate and you're more or less uh, have reached chemical accuracy. So I think this is a, a real, you think this is really interesting. And with this, I come to an end. These sigma functionals combine, I think, accuracy, wide applicability, because you can do van der Waals, you can do, do transition states, systems which have some static correlation uh, can be included. And there, there it's a very uh, attractive um, um, compromise. You can go systematically beyond this. I didn't have time to, to talk about this. If you include in your expansions also the exchange kernel, it becomes then a bit more expensive. This scales with the force power of the system size. This is this formally, this is a scaling of um, Hartree Fock. This would scale with the fifth power of uh, the system size. And generally, you can, so to speak, you have new areas for DFT, which, which you can open. This is which before you, you needed highly accurate and expensive um, wave function methods like coupled cluster. And I think with these sigma functionals, you get a similar accuracy. And actually, they are more robust in the sense that you can also uh, start uh, breaking bonds, which in, in single reference coupled cluster often leads to problems that you don't have. So they are robust and give you a very good accuracy at a reasonable price. OK, that's it, what I wanted to talk about. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas, for the wonderful talk. Um, in particular, it was very, uh, I liked it. It was very, it went into the details and explained everything well.